Hey there, everybody. P. Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Rank in the Albums. It's been a couple of weeks since we've done one of these shows, and we've got to, in the co-captain's chairs from the UK, Simon Bray and Stephen Reed, the UK Connection, and perfect show for today because we're talking about one of the most prolific UK bands of all time, Status Quo. We're rocking all over the world, people. Got my denim. There you go. You're all ready to go. You're all, uh, what is it? Uh, blue for you today? It's blue for us. Blue for us. Mm. There you go. There you go. So uh, obviously, folks watching, if you're a fan of uh, Status Quo, you know they got like a million albums. So we're not going to rank all the albums. We're basically going to do our, our favorite 10, our top 10. Uh, in addition, this is kind of part one. So in about a week, week and a half, you're going to get a part two, which I think it's just, I'm just going to sit and watch. But Simon and Steven are going to give you their, what is it, 10 least favorite, the 10 stinkers, something like that, whatever, whatever they decide to do, I'm totally cool with. So today's the good stuff. Next episode, the not so good stuff. So we'll, we'll, we'll play nice today. Uh, but on the next episode, uh, we might not play so nice. So uh, I'm going tuned. into witness protection after that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, well Certainly from my point of view, we'll play very nice today. Yes, we'll play very nice today. I'm, I'm going to play nice. very nice today. I, I, I'm pretty happy with my list. So we're going to start at number 10, work our way back. Uh, Stephen, you want to give a brief little history of the band before we get started, as always? Okay, doke. Well, brief little history of a band that are coming up for 60 years together. 60. That's six zero, everybody. They formed in 1962 as the Scorpions. There was no big city nights, not, not, not those Scorpions. They became the Spectres. Um, by that stage, they had, well, Francis Rossi and Alan Lancaster. So you've got the singer, a guitarist, and bassist, singer, and singer. At the, right at the start, John Coughlin joins as they become the Spectres. So that's the first drummer. Then they become the Traffic Jam. Then they become the Status Quo, and eventually become Status Quo. So Rick Parfit joins in 1967, and you've got your classic four in the band at that stage, Rossi, Parfit, Lancaster, and Coughlin, and a guy called Roy Lins, or Lines, on keyboards, who basically had enough, packed up, went home, decided they didn't want to bother anymore, and almost through necessity, status quo became a four-piece. So that band, the frantic four as they became, the kings of the 12-bar boogie, lasted from 1970, until 1981, and at that stage, John Coughlin was, I think the, the phrase I would use was requested to leave by a certain band member, um, and Pete Kutcher came in on drums, Andy Bone joined on keyboards at that time, although he'd really been with the band for a long, long time prior to that. Then they hit the end of the road, the status quo were no more, they were finishing up, they were, it was never going to happen, then they were made in the better commas, to open Live Aid in 1985. So the lineup that had finished up got back together. Then the band split, or at least Alan Lancaster, the bassist, thought the band had split. The status quo continued, unbeknown to Mr. Lancaster, and uh, Rhino Edwards joined on bass at that stage, and Jeff Rich came in on drums, and we started from the In the Army Now album at that stage. From there, we've had another couple of drummers, uh, Matt Leckley and Leon Cave. Unfortunately, uh, Rick Parfit is no longer with us. Rick passed away in 2016. The band continue on, uh, and with Richie Malone on guitars and vocals, they are still uh, in a five-piece configuration. Uh, they released one album with that lineup, uh, Backbone, which is, is the most recent one. And then sadly, just on the 26th of September this year, Alan Lancaster passed away, so that was the, the, one of the founding members of the band, uh, bassist, singer, wrote an awful lot of their songs. Very much, for my money, a, a vital member of the band who changed completely when he was no longer part of them. Um, 2013 and 2014, we did get some frantic four shows, so the classic four got back together, um, played some reunion shows, which... I witnessed one of the Glasgow ones. It was outstandingly good. They played all the classics. It was just early. It was based around the live album, Quo Live. Um, and they were just superb. So 33 albums, 33 studio albums this band have released. 
16 years consecutively, from 1968 to 1983, this band released an album every single year. Okay, that's madness. Okay, now I've gone on a long time, however, bear with me, okay? Because we're going to kick quo in the next show, okay? We are. There's, there's no way around that. So let's mention 2014, they received the Services to Rock Award from the Kerrang! magazine, of all magazines at that stage. Rick Parfit and Francis Rossi both have OBEs, which they got in 2009. In 1991, they entered the Guinness Book of World Records for playing four shows in one day. I was at the Glasgow show. They also did Birmingham, Sheffield and London. Some young band of teens knocked them off that pedestal about a week later. They played four shows in, in like a walking distance, not five shows in walking distance, but anyway. It was good fun nonetheless. Nazareth supported that day. That was a good lineup. Oh, wow. Middle of the afternoon, very weird. Went to a gig that finished at two o'clock in the afternoon, but there you go. Uh, they received the Outstanding Contribution to the British Music Industry 1991's Brit Awards, which do not do rock music in any shape or form normally. They got the Outstanding Contribution to the Rock Industry Award in the same year. They have sold 118 million units. Okay, although Alan Lancaster, prior to his passing, disputed that number because he sure as shit ain't seen the money for all of those. <laughs> so that was his words. <laughs> Not mine. Um, in 2013, the band released their 100th single. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, they had 106 appearances on top of the pops. Okay, they have spent the equivalent of seven and a half years. That's 415 weeks in the UK singles charts. <laughs> 43 hit albums in the UK, including studio, live and compilations. That's the second most by any band ever. Only the Rolling Stones have more. And they have 60 chart hits in the UK singles charts, which is the most ever. And 22 of those have reached the top 10. Wow. So the amazing thing is, amazing how big they would have been if anybody here in the States gave a shit. That's Absolutely. the crazy thing. They did all that with being nobodies here. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Massive everywhere else. Never even came close mm. to breaking America. Never. Never. I mean, barely even a cult act. Amazing. That's yeah. crazy. That is cool. Well, that's, crazy. that's some good history so, here. And there you uh, go. It was one yeah. I wanted to pick out three or four, but the, the more I read today, the more I thought, do you know what? Give them props because that, that's amazing, isn't it? That's yeah. absolutely Amazing, ridiculous. I mean, legends on your side of the pond. Just, yeah, you know, man, crazy. Yeah, there was a period when I was growing up. I mean, I'll start the show and... Here we go, there's the first vinyl album that I ever bought. Oh, okay. Okay, volume one and two. So this is 1984, I was 11, everybody. Okay. They must have a million compilation albums. Oh yeah, absolutely they do. <laughs> Absolutely, they do. Um, and this is volume one and volume two. Volume one is, I mean, that's, that's the real deal. There's the picture of volume one, realistically. Volume two right. starts to kind of peter away a little bit because they're chronological in that sense. But Quo were everywhere when I was young, and I would imagine that Simon would agree with that. They were on kids' TV, they were on chat shows, the music was on the radio, it was on adverts on the telly, everywhere. Couldn't move for them. You know, Simon's wearing the uh, the denim jacket, and it's just like that. I, to me, again, you guys have all, had a lot more exposure to the band, but they they just seem to me like one of the the perfect like blue collar band, and that's why they're so relatable, right? They're the band for everybody, for the most part. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you don't lose the show, Simon. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> let me talk you through the stages of Quo as I see it. I think to some extent they've always been kind of like scene chasers. Um, at every point in, in their career and, and there was a point where it really really worked and there were other points where it kind of didn't you know so they, they did the psychedelic flower power stuff and let me tell you I loathe and despise psychedelia so there are the, no pictures of Matchstick Man in this for me no and if they if they aren't the new originals in Spinal Tap then Jesus Christ I'd really like to know who you are um then they had a follow. They had a follow period where they tried to kind of kind of find this, and then they found their sound. And for nine, ten years, they were just the shit. Now I'm older than you, aren't I? And I don't 
remember much of that period when they were the shit. It's only like retrospectively. Now, I remember, because I, I grew up, I became a teenager in, um, and uh, yeah, um, 12 Gold Boys was one, one of the first records that I actually bought with my own money. And I think from there, Get, it did have massive success in the seventies. Just a shitload of it. Hit number one albums. When you go back, when you go back and look, my God, they were popular. And then suddenly decided they wanted to be more commercial, which is a bit weird, given that they'd enjoyed enormous commercial success. Yeah. yeah. And from there yeah, on in. Yeah. On. No, I was just going to say that it's an interesting journey that they went on. It appears. And let, I mean, we're going to do two shows here. However, it would appear that there was one person that wanted to drive the musical evolution of the band. And that necessitated the, the departure of the, you know, not original drummer, but the guy that was the drummer that, in my opinion, made their sound. And then the original bassist and co-founder. And from there, things go quite bizarre musically. And some of the choices that they took. I'm not going to go too into detail because I've already got my status no list made up and in the army now is an album I'd like to actually focus on for a specific reason so there's no point giving that away today and then what happens after then is I would suggest what needed to happen after that was somebody needed to gently slap Andy Bone's hands as he went on a keyboard for far too long uh, and yeah and from there, after a long period of that, they tried to get back to what had made their name. And suddenly, they became everyone's favourite uncles. You know, it's interesting, though, Simon, you mentioned that, you know, somewhere along the way, they decided they wanted to be even more commercial. But, I mean, they had a lot of success in the 70s. Which exactly. They were, they were an so album band. Why then... change that? I mean, it's like it was working fine. Record company pressure or... They, they they went shit. And in my humble opinion, it's because, well, I've been kind of putting this list together for a wee while, and it's kind of taken me down a YouTube rabbit hole of snippets and interviews and various things, um, and watched in some of the, the stuff that came out about Alan Lancaster in recent times with, with his sad passing. Um, and his take on it was that Francis Rossi really, once the, you know, <laughs> took hold, <laughs> decided that he liked absolutely nothing about what status quo had been mm. and just wanted to change that band entirely. And the sound changes. And if you listen to what Francis has done, the limited amount of stuff he's done outside of the band, it's pretty pants, really. Do you know? Um, and it lacks what you would call any heart or soul. And that would appear to be what he tried to bring to the band yeah. at that stage. And I was really pleasantly surprised by how decent, it's not brilliant, but how decent Backbone was, the only album without Parfit on it, because I really was quite frightened by that. And I bought it and listened to it and thought, actually, it's okay. There's a couple of half-decent songs on it. It's not a terrible listen, but I'd expect it to be pop, pop, because that would appear to be what Mr. Rossi likes, I would suggest. And he's quite disparaging about an awful lot of old quo. He'll tell you that. No, oh, Peter's off. He'll tell you that, you know, they had lots of rubbish on their early albums. He'll tell you that, you know, what came afterwards and what's the era that we don't like. Hi, Peter. Is, is fantastically good in comparison. Uh, and, I mean, he's done, he did a, a kind of countryish album in recent times with a young lady, can't remember her name, that's terrible. Somebody will... A record. Thank you. Um, and it was, it was okay. Ish. You give it quite a good review. I gave it quite a good review because for what it was, it was, it was okay. Have I listened to it since? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> not, not worth the time going back to it, right? How no, we said that. No. Not when there's so much good music comes out. Do you know? Simple. Now we're half an hour in. Yes, I know. Yeah. Well, for all, well, you know what? That this first half hour is for all the folks here in the U.S. who 
don't have a clue about this band. <laughs> there you go. Now everybody's all caught up. With that being said, Simon, kick us off with your number 10. Just before I do that, yeah. <laughs> I've been trying to think of a similar American act that are really, really big, yet mean sod all. Anyway, you know, so I thought something like Dave Matthews or something like that, or and I don't think there's an equivalent. Well, you know, there there is a couple of bands that were maybe not as big here as compared to Quo that we're talking about in the UK, but I have spoken to plenty of people who watch the channel over the years who don't understand why there was any fascination with Grand Funk Railroad here in the States when they were nobodies in the UK. Kansas is another example. The Doobie Brothers is another example. Who So many people from the UK are like, I don't know why you guys spend any time talking about this band. They, they never came here. They never sold any records here. They never played them on the radio. So there's probably some, but I don't know if any would compare to the immenseness of Quo in the UK. Like, the longevity. Funk were big here, but they weren't like the shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Other than like maybe a year or two. Simon's hit the nail on the head there with longevity because there's two that I would maybe right, feel like Bob, right. Bob Seeger, because he was massive in the States for a period of time. Never did anything over here. I mean, he was known, but he wasn't a star. And in a way, Leonard Skinner, I mean, they can play decent sized venues here, you know, and most people over here would know a couple of their songs. Outside of the, the difference with Quo over here was they moved outside of the rock circle. They, they, they were household names. They were the housewife's favourite. Your granny knew, knew who status quo was. Everybody knew who status quo were. Mm. And a lot of people still do. Yeah. Leonard Skinner, not so much in the States. Ginormous band. Oh, Skinner's, yeah, huge. You know, like that's doing them a disservice over here because they can play, I and mean, I've seen them play decent sized venues over here. So I'm saying again, as Simon says, I can't actually get that comparison. Yeah. But they're kind of as near as I can go. Mm. Musically as well, you know, before I actually do mention them, they, say, they are the quo, and there's elements of quo within everything that we're going to slag off in 10 days' time. They still at times yeah. sound like the quo, you know, they're still like the old fashioned kind of quo. They still, the quoness is still the quarter. <laughs> <It's still there. laughs> should, I, should I go for uh, number 10 now? Let's talk oh, about all of this, I suppose. It, it, somebody may expect us to. Yeah, <laughs> no, now, that it, now that it's Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, Stephen, for once, is entirely correct. that They did have they, they have had a bit of a renaissance um, over the past um, decade-ish. You know, really, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, my num- um, and as I was saying to you uh, before we started, Pete, um, most of my Quonus is on is on cassettes and therefore lives in the uh, much fabled loft, um, and quite a lot of the recent stuff is actually on M- MP3s for review copies. So this is where you hold up your um, your um, hard drive and pretend that it's quid pro quo, which is my number ten. Oh, I didn't bring that. One. Here we go. Yes. There you go. You see. In fact, I'm I'm, I'm going to big up. Left latter period quo at some point tonight. Um, it's a bit long. Um, but it's really solid after a very, very fallow period, apart from in search of in search of the fourth chord, 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 um, which um nearly made it, nearly made it. You know, some really good songs on there, two-way traffic, rock and roll and you, which I watched the video for um just before I came into this room and it's a bit cringy. But um, yeah, uh, leave a little, little light on, good one. Reality check. And I think this is almost as good as late period quo gets. And it's really solid um, album and not a covers album. And I think that's, you know, yeah. Getting back to play, playing some actual guitar, rocking away. Yeah. It's, it's a, if, you're, if you're looking for some later period quo, it's actually quite difficult to get hold of. Um, quid pro quo. One and a half thumbs up, yeah. I think it's quite difficult to get a hold of because in the UK it was exclusively sold in Tesco. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. Other supermarkets are available. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that showed you the kind of audience that the record labels thought that they were aiming at. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. For me, and Simon's already mentioned it because I'm in Latter Day. Now, by Latter Day 2007, I'm in 
the search for the fourth chord. That's where I am. This is one of two more recent, more recent, how old are we? Um, Stay School albums that I've got in my top 10. I really like this album. I like the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning. Uh, that's a really catchy number. It kind of, you know, harks back to, to, to days of old. Uh, but it, it's got a great hook. It's really it's been the live set for a long time, wasn't it? Yeah, they, they actually played quite a lot of, of uh, a couple of albums in the live set and changed it about, unlike most heritage acts, which which I like as well. Um, Gravy Train on this, and that's heavy as anything. It's really, really, you know, riff driven in a time when you kind of thought they maybe wouldn't do that anymore. Um, it's also good in the sense that it's got quite a bit of Bob Young involved. Bob Young is a major player in the Co story. Co wrote an awful lot of their hits, plays harmonica on an awful lot of their songs, and really was a major force in the Co sound. He wrote with three guys regularly on and off over the years. And, and this album kind of brought him back to the fore, which was a really good thing. Um, Bad News is sung by Rhino, which I think was underused. He's actually really quite good. So he's got some solo stuff. I've heard it, but on the centre of the list that again recently, I think, hmm, I maybe should. Uh, and it's also got four words on the back that should make all status quo fans quite scared. Produced by Pip Williams, because Pip Williams is an awful lot to do with why the sound went <laughs> at a certain point. But he turns up here and it's really quite good. And he adds a bit of guitars. I had a tendency to when he works with Co as well. So that, that's my number 10 in the search. The search for the fourth chord. It's a long time. Yeah, I remember when that came out, a lot of people were pretty excited about it. You know, yeah. you get sent that to review for the website. And yeah, a lot of good positive press for the Quo right around that time. All right. So I will admit right now that I am not as knowledgeable overall of the entire catalog like these two gentlemen are, because like I mentioned before, here in the United States, nobody knows who the hell this band is. So including myself till about a decade ago, right? So uh, I've been kind of playing catch up and I have basically, you know, stuck to a lot of the early to mid period in their catalog. That's what I know. So I'm ranking what I know here. Uh, number 10, I'm going to go to 1977, Rockin' All Over the World, which was their what? 10th album, 12th album? I don't, I don't even know. Something like that. I lost track. Number 10. No, number 10. Okay. Good, good, uh, good call there. So um, good album. I think it's a little lighthearted than maybe some of the albums that came before it. I think you're starting to see where they were going to be moving into the 80s, uh, but still the formula is there. Boogie, hard rock, little bits of pop. Can't give you more. Hard time. Kind of memorable. They open up the album. They're a uh, little bit lighter than some of the stuff that comes after it on the album. I think uh, Let's Ride is pretty rocking. Got some good riffing, good rhythms. Uh, you Don't Own Me. Rock's pretty hard. I think, uh, what is it, uh, Rocker's Rolling. Like that quite a bit. Good, tight boogie, which is what these guys do so well. Uh, the title track is a really fun anthem. I always really like that a lot. Too Far Gone, nice speedy rocker uh, that kind of, to my ears, sees a little bit of what we would call new wave in just a few short years creeping into the music. And I know they kind of embraced like early 90s music a little bit. Uh, overall, it's a decent, fun album. I think they definitely have better from this period, which I'm going to get to. But uh, I like it. Uh, there's half the album I really dig a lot. The other half is OK. But I think it's a fun album and it still sounds to my ears like what we know of Quo from the early mid 70s. So that's my number 10. Back to song. Thank you. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm going to give some love to um, latter period quo, and I think this one has already been described as something like "all right," and that's good. That is quality praise, as far as I yeah, backbone, yeah, got it. Yeah, really good. yeah. Um, it wasn't going to be, and then I listened to it earlier this week, and I thought I really like that. It's it's a it's a really pleasing album. Um, it's a very confident album. It starts off with um, Waiting for a Woman, which is kind of gentle, almost ZZ Top-ish kind of groove going on there. Um, Cut Me Some Slack is classic quo. Um, classic quo. Um, and I think it's important, you know, like when, when we've been doing other bands previously, I, I think we've been trying to describe what you do when you're listening to those bands. And when you're listening to the quo, you've got to nod your head. You just go, 
you're driving along, you're listening to the quote, you're nodding your head, you're doing the guitar, you're doing the guitar thing. And you know, the other phrase for me that plays is uh, chugga chugga, because the guitar is just chugga chugga. They, they really do. If I've written chugga chugga in these notes once, I've written it 50 times. Um, Liberty Lane, uh, upbeat, chugga chuggas along. It, it was really good live. I saw them before the album came out, so it was, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I see you're in there, in, see you're in some trouble, sorry. Um, I feel that's where Rick was missed. I feel like his vo he could have his vocal would have been uh, good there, but my head was apparently firmly nodding when I was making my notes on, on this record. But uh, backing off possibly could be um, heavier, more pounding. But you know, the, the Francis Ross is in his seventies. You know, how rocking can a seventy odd year old be? Yeah, um, it's just a really good so, uh, solid record. Uh, solid record. The title track's a bit lyrically weak, um, but you know, um, as is, I think, obligatory at some at some point in like any cool slash related album. There's a John David cover, and on this one, it's um, Better Take Care, which apparently Chugga Chugga's along. <laughs> yes, and and interestingly, all every band member gets to, gets to write a song. It's a, like almost like a pretend democracy when we all know. But it isn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you know the the what the Leon Cave song, um, falling off, falling off the world's really nice, very very nice. What crap! I use that every, everywhere. It's nice. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> song, yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a really good, solid, confident thirty third record. Thirty three, and it goes around at thirty three RPM. And the very cool. <laughs> I actually think it might be my favourite 33rd album from any band. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's a huge list, right? Yeah. <laughs> somebody's somebody's going to list a better one down there. Go on, yeah. go on, go on, somebody. Because <laughs> you know they're out there, right? There are a couple. Oh, yeah, yeah, somebody has. How, how many so, albums do the Stones have? Um, I don't think quite that many, right? I don't think quite that many because they have relied really, I mean, as as have the Quo, but on the live act yeah. for a long, long, long time now. And I think the Stones kind of got to the stage where they thought, you know, we can sell out stadiums. Let's not sell three albums. Yeah. <laughs> it's not I can't that. think of, I, you know what? You know who I think might have them beat? Hawkwind. Well, Yes. And what if they the, had, don't have them beat, it's pretty damn close. Yeah, I'd need to know what the thirty third one was. Yeah, to put it up against Backbone. <laughs> <laughs> While you're talking about your number nine, I'm going to look it up because I am really interested now. Well, there you go. So, in my number nine, what I've discovered is that Simon is right. Every song has that sound, but I spelt it slightly different. I didn't spell it chugga chugga. Up in Scotland, having a chug is a different thing entirely. Okay. Take a guess um, how many albums Hawkwind has. Sorry to, to interrupt you. Hawkwind have. What year did they form, Peter? Uh, what, what, 69, something like that. Yeah, 69. I think Hawkwind have 48 albums. <laughs> I, I can tell you how many Hawkwind albums I own. Yeah, how many? None. <laughs> <laughs> they have 34. 34. 34. So one more than um, his quote. Was the 33 any good? So what was the second last one then? Uh, I will tell you. The, the second to last one was Carnivorous, which I've never heard. There you go. And neither have I, so I can't do the comparison. Yeah. Oh, well. There you go. So Backbone, the is, win. Backbone is still my favourite 33rd album by any band that I'm aware of. There you go. I am aware of that one. So anyway, the point being that Simon says chugga chugga, but to me, it, it you should spell it D-E-R, der. That's how, that's how all the songs go, really. <laughs> so my number nine is whatever you want, which to me, I mean, it opens with the title track. I am struggling to think of any song anywhere that has a better intro to that song. I absolutely adore, there's a three part intro, it goes through different sections, and by the time that the actual riff kicks in and the vocals kick in, which is over a minute in the song, I think, I mean, oh, you're ready for it. And live, it just gets everybody going. It's a really clever piece of songwriting. 
because it just gets everyone up for it. Ears on the back of the neck, and it's just exciting. And we're at a stage where I'm trying to think I've got one that will show it better, but probably not. I'm going to have to show. I loved this when I was young. This from the makers of. Okay, so what you had was these little thumbnails before a thumbnail was a thing, of all of the albums that had come before. Not quite all. There are earlier ones than, than Dog of Two Head, but we don't own them. Do you know? And it's not from the makers of a different kind of lineup. Like, what is it? Don't know. Maybe not. But they just don't put anything earlier than that on there. But I've always liked that. But anyway, yes, whatever you want. This is album number 12, 1979. For me, they had a little bit of a dip prior to this, but there's some stuff on here, like Living on an Island. I mean, that's that's not cool. That's not the... the, the, the -na 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 -na. That's a beautiful bit of acoustic guitar, and it's a cry for help. That, that's a lonely rock star who is just lost in the world. I absolutely adore that song. It's a Rick Parfit song, and it's just, it shows what a wonderful singer he was. He could rock it up too, uh, but I really like that. Shady Lady, that's a great, great song as well. But the whole thing, I really like this album. Runaway, that's great fun. And, and same again, lots of Bob Young on this album and co writes. So whatever you want is my number nine. Great album cover too, I think. <clears throat> yeah. I dig that. My number nine. Actually, uh, while I was putting together my my list, really rose up. It was never intended to be in my top ten, and uh, then I listened to it again. I'm like, yeah, I kind of dig this album. And uh, it is 1981's "Never Too Late." I kind of like the uh, the rocket ship covers, uh, this and the one before that, right? And you know what I just noticed there, uh, Stephen. Look, look along here. You have the little thumbnails of the prior. Oh, nice. Ni I have never, never gone and done the, the remaster thing. Yeah, with, I'm with all my reissues. So these are the uh, these are the Mercury Universal reissues, I guess, uh, remasters. I never noticed that before. It's pretty cool. Yeah, lots of bonus tracks on those editions as well. I've got some promos of those. Um, right. So like some B-sides and lots of live stuff and things. If anybody wants to go out and give them a go, they're good issues. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So uh, never too late. Uh, the last album with the classic lineup, classic four. Um, good hard rocking songs on here. Uh, title track, it's great. Great way to open up the album. You got the the kind of barroom boogie of something about you, you know, baby I like something about something. Sorry, something about you, baby I like. Not something yeah, about you. I gotta say it right there. You know. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> Take Me Away is great. Falling In, Falling Out. It's got that nice metallic riffing. Just really like that a lot. Uh, you know, Oh Carol is just barnstorming fun. Uh, you got Mountain Lady, which is really different, I think, for them. And I really like it. It's got some nice textures, different types of chords. It's not your standard boogie track. I like it. Uh, you know, kind of an end of, end of an era for the band, but it's a really strong album. Fun, good, rocking. I like it. Good stuff. I love the uh, album cover, too. So I am delighted that you chose that, Peter, because that's that would have been had we been doing honorable mentions. That would be my honorable mention. It's the one I couldn't quite squeeze in the top 10. Really like it. Though. Yeah, it's good. It's good. I like I think I like it more than I thought, you know, looking at all these albums. I was like, wow, I kind of dig this. And I put put another one off to the side because of it. So there you go. All right, back to Simon. Number eight. Okay, my number eight is Mark Kelly's Greasy Spoon, which I know that somebody's got somewhere. Firstly, it's a great album cover. It's just so Saturday night, Sunday morning. Uh, just I look, yeah. Do also, you? Yeah, it's, Do you? I think it looks, looks like you know, um, a cinema verite kind of thing going on there. Nice. Do you know what that cover actually reminds me of? We went off covers like that. That's right, the Smiths. <laughs> just, I just wanted to say that just for shits and giggles. Yeah. Oh. Anyhow. It's you, at this I, point that it, and I, I'm just going to say sorry. So as I, I mean, as a young chap picking up his music, th this was not an album. This is one of the last early albums that I bought because I absolutely hate the cover. It just said to me, I don't want to have that album. Great cover. It just says, look, working class. 
Yeah. It's, Either that or it says like like a, a an old fifties black and white movie, you know, like a like an old cheesy uh US sci-fi movie with like giant spiders and shit. And and the someone walks into a diner, it's like, oh, well, I'll have a uh, I'll have your breakfast special. And she walks up to you with the cigarette in her mouth saying, We ain't got no more of the breakfast special. What else you want, honey? That's kind of what that reminds me of. I just failed the box. Do you know, finally I say something about a cover and you, you go off on one. But does it have a sticker? Shall we go down that route? It is different, though, I will say that. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's definitely, it's definitely holy segues. And it's a different album. This is in the period where they're moving away from the... So it's, it's, I think it's a really great canned heat album in places. It's got that kind of that kind of shuffly kind of thing going on there. It's got Junior's Whale, Junior's Whale and all. Yeah, what a great way to start both an album and a gig. You see what I did there? Yeah, Fra frantically foring away there. Um, it's it's got a Peter Green cover on it, which is something I didn't really kind of pick up on previously. Uh, Lazy Poker Blues. Um, real. This is something I'm going to say a lot in in a couple of weeks' time. Um, daughter, keyboards, go away. Stop it. Stop it. Stop keyboarding it up. Please. Off you go. Go on. In that window. Come on. Take, and take your keyboard with you. Yes. <laughs> which is interesting. Because um, I am going to go on at some point and say how much I really like Andy Brown as a musician. But anyway, let's move along. And um, it's also got Is It Really Me? Slash Gotta Go Home on. And this is where this is where people's if if they've got 45, 48 minutes into this, uh, this is where the quo go a little bit proggy. You know, the, and really um, heavy too, man. Really, yeah, heavy. nine and a half minutes of unfocused, arguably, um, genius. Yeah, because they're like least qual like vocals, and it's just brilliant. Uh, oh, inspiringly brilliant, yet meandering, yet you know, you know, get lost, Led Zeppelin. You know, this is this is this is where the real shits are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Could you imagine if they had taken that direction and did like a whole album of that? Because exactly. it's heavy. And it's, it's taught, you mentioned Zeppelin, you can think like, uh, you know, Mountain and Cream. I mean, that's what, that, there's no boogie in that song. That's like a totally different thing. <laughs> if you were to like play that to someone who maybe was not, you know, maybe casually aware of who Status Quo are or were or some of their songs, and you played them that song, they would never in a million years guess that it was Status Quo. It sounds nothing like anything they've ever done. I, I personally think that that epic track is absolutely wonderful. Maybe that's why it completely missed the charts. It could maybe, be. maybe it's because of the hideous cover. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on. Off we go. Come on. Next. What was it mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, next is is the next album. Dog of Two Head. There's an album cover. Come on, Simon. That's an album cover. It really is, yeah, yeah. It really is. It's, it's really yeah. quite literal as well. It's a dog, and it's got two heads. But it's also got. But look, look how much is going on here. The band members are all here. Look, everyone's turned up. Right? Right? They're all here. We've got an S and a Q in the middle of the dog. Okay, you've got some beautiful colours. You've got an off-center band name. Yeah, right. <laughs> Still upsets me. Now. <laughs> really I thought you were going to say it's cool. No, that really upsets me. Don't have it off center. Like, lyrics, do you know? See, this, Any this, songs? Does it have songs? Oh, uh, uh, is there a record in here? Is there yeah, a song in here? But look at them. Look, 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 there's a statement here. That's Whoa, a great he gatefold. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Look at that. We're going to rock now. We're oh, going yeah. to rock now. And then they've got things like Na 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 on here, which does not rock. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like that, though. It's a silly throwaway piece about how to write a song and how throwaway songwriting can be, and it appears three times, four times on the album, three times on the album, and only once in a, in a kind of finished version. And I really like the, the kind of quirkiness of that. It opens with, how do you say it? How on earth do you say it? Umleitung? Yeah. Is that how you say that? But that's that's a headstone stomper. That's a great song. Yeah. You know, you've got something going on in my head, which is so insistent. It's but there's a lightness of touch there as well. A lot of people don't give Quo the credit at any point in their career about how good the musicianship is. 
that's on the go here. Go and pick 10 states go songs and try and cover them. You'll find it's much harder than you thought it was. We did in a band many years ago. Uh, you've got Mean Girl on here. Do you know? It's like mean, 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 mean girl. That's a classic. That's an gotcha. absolute classic. Yeah. And then you've got Gerdon Jula, which I see him again. It's a, a complete departure musically. It's sweet and it's light and it becomes a live highlight in more recent years when they all stand side by side playing each other's guitar and various things. Uh, and yeah, it's great. I must admit that when I was young, this one kind of passed me, I mean, this is way older than I was. This this is born, this was born two years before I was born, album number four. <laughs> took me a long time to kind of get into this because it wasn't just the -na 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 that I'd anticipated. But the older I get, the more I like this. And actually the higher up these kind of lists, it goes in my head. A lot of guitar solos on that album. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're, they're a band just about to find their sound. And, in, and as we're saying with Mark Kelly's Greasy Spoon, and then into Dog of Two Head, finding their sound, but also pulling from other places that they don't then go on to necessarily use elsewhere. And it's not always a bad thing because what those two albums give you is really quite exciting. Yeah, yeah. Cool, good choice. More on that in a bit. Uh, number eight for me, I'm also going to go with uh, Whatever You Want from 79. I like this album a lot. And like you mentioned with the bonus tracks, there's like, what, six bonus tracks on this, all sorts of uh, demo versions and extra tracks and all that kind of stuff. But I I love the title track. Man, it doesn't get much better than that as far as like sing-along boogie anthems. A Shady Lady, uh, I like Who Asked You, kind of has this faces sound to it going on, you know? um come rock with me good sounding album i love the production on this album the guitars sound like larger than life uh, like i said i love the album cover this is uh for me a much stronger album than rocking all over the world which came before it i think this is a tremendous tremendous album so that's my number eight seven seven yes which is exactly how many goals blackburn rovers conceded last night Anyhow, seven, yes. Um, I never, I, I, that passed me by. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to get your jollies where you can find it. Um, yeah. uh, seven, right, this is, this is weird, because um, my seven could have been uh, whatever you want, but I relegated that to not being in the top ten, because I went with Just Supposing from 1980. Um, mainly because I really like... Um, what you're proposing, which made, made number two in the UK singles charts. You know, and now, now they toss it off in a, med, in a medley, don't they, when they play it live. And Pete's loving the... Um, I love the Rockets, man. I love there them. There you go. There hold you hold go. up Never Too Late for me, Peter. What's that? Hold up Never Too Late for me. I didn't bring it through. There you go. I, I, I love... the. Sorry, Simon. These these are from the same session, these albums. Real yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I, and basically, I so your rocket on your album cover is blasting off into space, and yep. as it gets into space, the quo hand reaches it like, nah, no, you don't, throws it back down to Earth. Yep. That's, cool. that's my prediction uh, on how that came about. Oh, look at that. Another great live shot there, or live shots. Yep. Anyhow, back to me. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, think, I think what they did with this album is they actually did what they wanted to do later after, when they reformed after End of the Road. Um, the singles are all really good. Yeah, they're all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, or at least well-known singles. Um, but the filler's good as well. Whereas post End of the Road, the singles, you know, were memorable and sold pretty well, but the filler was filler. Filler, yeah. Yeah, whoever, whoever chose the band's singles all the way through their career did a phenomenal job. I don't know if it was a member of the band or it was a member of management or if it was just the labels, but man oh man did they get it right. Mm. Yeah, and I was I was looking, admittedly it's only up until about 1990, which is now 30 years ago. Mm. You could sing every core single for, from about 72, 73, up to you know, that 18 year period, you could sing them, you'd know them, especially in the UK, you'd have heard them incessantly. They'd been on every television program. And like you say, they were all good singles. Yes, but just supposing has good singles and good actual songs. But I mean, who remembers um, Lies slash Don't Drive My Car? It was a double A single. Who remembers double A singles? Oh my God. 
I'm just going to take that out because I actually have, still have that single one. I didn't. It's in a box underneath this desk here, which I had now. <laughs> did, you, did, you not, did you not get inside my mind? I try my hardest not to. You got to know that he's going to ask for those things, right? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't like, I don't like being there. It's scary. <laughs> Very empty, yes. Um, yeah, but um, a double A sign. And uh, Christ, well, you know, they must have gone, which one are we going to do on top of pots? Because they're both so, re you know, really good. You know, and I think um, Don't Drive My Car is my, probably my favorite Rick Parfit vocal. Well, it is. It's not, there's no, you know, it just, it, it just is. Um, belatedly, they released rock and roll as a single, a ballad with, with whistling. Yeah, get lost, Scorpions. Yeah, we're doing it a long, long time before that. Is it not um, single whistling, though? It's whistling. You know what I mean? Yeah. Real or fake, it's whistling, right? <laughs> yeah, whistling. It's a, uh, anyway, getting back to the serious shit, it's a much more modern kind of modern sound. You know, they were, they were, they were going towards that kind of more Pip williams y process -y kind of... Mm, uh, this that I have just decided to call it. And I think it's the most, if I, if to met my ears, it's, easy, it's the most successful amalgamation of old core and new and uh, new core, particularly in terms of uh, production values. Um, yeah, and I, I would imagine uh, this really, this is almost certainly bullshit what I'm about to say, but I just cannot imagine that Kerry King could keep up with um, run, the, the guitars on Run to Mummy. I just don't think he could. I just, he's just so fun. It's like, what the, what? You know, really pro proper speedy shit. It really is, you know, yeah. That tells you something, because Kerry King can play some speedy shit, right? <laughs> yeah, you see, you see the comparison I made there. I was right, I was right pleased with myself. We're dri driving down the road. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, I've done that. We gotta get the we gotta get Slayer in here somewhere, right? So here you go. Yeah, because there's a real yeah, synergy between the two bands. This, pro this program has already been twice as long as Raining Blood. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, dear. he's here all week, folks. <laughs> all the damn time. Oh. We're gonna we're gonna see that on a we're gonna see that on a t-shirt I think one of these days. <laughs> Woo! Okay, give me, give me a seven. Come on, you know you want to. There you go. So this is more more modern. I mean, it's nearly twenty years old, but it's more modern. Two thousand and two. This is merely album number twenty five. This is heavy traffic, uh, and this is to me. Okay, oh, that being, is that is an elephant or two. Yeah, or yeah they're being chased by elephants down the road. I'm not really <laughs> sure why. I suppose I because love elephants, but that's a bizarre cover. Yeah, I suppose because it's and an, an elephants are heavy. Oh, I would the road. Genius, genius. See, thinking no inside people. the box. <laughs> inside the box, you have blues and rhythm. D -d 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 blues and rhythm, which I really like. Oh, stand up. That's that's another great song. Never say never. Uh, the Oriental, probably politically incorrect. However, it's got a really great beat to it. It's got a really great feel to it. Really like that. Creeping up on you. I like just about everything on this album. And in the CD age, that says quite a lot because usually albums are too long at this stage, 2002. 14 songs on here that actually isn't a stinker anywhere. Even a song called Diggin' Buck Bacharach is really good, uh, but it's just, I really like this. Um, Jam Side Down, they played that a lot in the live set for a period of time as well. That's a really good song. I just like all of this, uh, I really do. Matt Letley on drums does a good job on this one. Um, I'm gonna come to the drums later on because they're really vital to me in this band. But yeah, I, I like everything about Heavy Traffic. This, if for me personally, if you want a latter day co-album, it's nearly 20 years old people, this is where you should go. I really like this. It's really strong. It's got a great sound and it rocks. Really like heavy traffic. Cool. Let's check that out. The Elephant album. I've never heard that one. Cool. All right. Hello. Hello uh, from 1973. Yes. How's everybody doing? Uh, <laughs> another early album here. Uh, you know, here the band have kind of figured out where they're going to exist in going forward. And, uh, you know, a bunch of classics on here roll over lay down is that still on the set list this day i mean that's in and out of the set for most of their career right uh claudie 
catchy song, a little bit of pop there, right? Blue Eyed Lady, great, great song, nice energy. I love the energy on this album. Uh, Caroline, one of their most famous songs. I mean, come on, who doesn't love Caroline? Uh, we've got 4,500 times. Nice, lengthy, boogie jam. Can we put that in a jar and sell it? Boogie jam? I don't know. It's uh, I, I, I like on these early albums where they do these like eight, nine, 10 minute long jams. And it's like, you know, you, you, you wonder, well, like, where were they going to go in the song like that? Well, they, they take you on a ride. There's only Quo can do. And uh, on this reissue, you got the bonus track of Joanne. So uh, I like it. Great album cover too, right? Just yep. basic. Just a little bit over them. Yeah. Yeah. Just really hello good. and black. Yeah. Simple message, but Simple. a very effective one. Simple, effective, but good. My number seven. Six. Six. Quo. Cool. The album Quo. Cool. It's my it's my numbers. There you go. It's mine. Oh, look at that. Look at that sexy vinyl. It's 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 my it's my it's my number six. Um, it's just, it was the third album in two years. I mean, holy shit. Yeah. That's some creative um process, isn't it? Really is. Um, I think it's arguably the best Alan Lancaster album that there is. Loads of co writes. He, 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 um, quite a few uh, lead lead vocals. Um, and some really great tunes. Um, Backwater. Um, it's kind of hypnotic and it's got Doorsy keyboards on it, which is interesting because I loathe and despise the Doors with every fiber of my being. I hate them. I really genuinely hate them. Just, just as long as we're all very clear. Don't like them, um, and yet this got, and yet, um, you know, it's that it is that kind of doorsy keyboardy thing on Batwalls that really kind of works for me. Just take me is super chuggy, or do 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 do, as some people might want to call, might want to suggest. And you know, I feel like um, you you have to actually physically go and buy a car to listen to break the rules, and then down down the road in your car. <laughs> You, it, it, I think I feel like you should have to do that. It's a really confident record, and at the risk of um, stealing uh, possibly some of Stephen's thunder, Coglan is brilliant on this. Just brilliant. In fact, I think it's brilliant most of the time. He just, he just like doesn't do too much. Keeps the beat. Sometimes, you know, on, on old records, the beat's not quite in time. Mm -hmm. you know, there's imperfections, and I like that. I like that. Modern music sucks because it all sounds perfect and processed and bleh. an organic nature is gone. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And these these albums sound great. And it, it just sounds like they've got a drummer and the, and the cymbals are bleeding into the other, into the other uh, into the other mics, and you think, yeah, like they, they might actually have played it together at some point. <laughs> Imagine that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably somebody's going, somebody's going to tell me that they didn't, but it sounds like they did, and it's an <laughs> excellent record. And for it to be, for it to be five better records, I actually said it's a stronger uh, catalogue than maybe we're going to give it credit for in a couple of weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I see. As soon as you've started down the Coglin path, I I will continue down that now. What fascinates me about this is you've got two remarkably talented chaps that were in this band for nearly all of their career and Alan Lancaster as well but he was much less to do with the decision making by the time that Coughlin was ousted for want of a better turn of phrase and no disrespect to anyone that's come since because they're all better drummers than I would ever have pretended to be um, but none of them none of them maybe Pete Kircher none of them can actually play a kind of shuffle swing beat it's fascinating that a band who made their time going Okay, got in drummers that all go. Not, not just uh, in the claw. Nick, tell me somebody else who, who swings quite like John Coghlan. Nobody. Exactly. nobody. Absolutely nobody. And you, you hit the nail on the head because if you really, on some of the albums, really, really tune into his ride cymbal work, it's almost like he intentionally drops it off the beat sometimes. And then he brings it back in. And then he drops it back off again and he brings it back in and he did that live as well and that's incredible because it keeps sometimes ahead of the music sometimes behind the music sometimes really driving it home 
and it always keeps what is dun, 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 really, really, really interesting. And, and, and to me, there is no other drummer that's been capable of doing that. But other guys can play boogie beats. And the band decided when they got back together to bring in very talented drummers that never played like that. So whether they were asked not to or just decided that's not what they were about, I don't know. I mean, a guy like Jeff Rich who came in, really talented drummer, that guy can play. But I saw them live with him and everything was... And you're just like, oh, man. Oh, wow. How to take that? The way I describe it is when Coughlin was no longer part of Quo, they took the soul out of that band. And when Lancaster was out, ousted, they ripped the heart out of it. That, to me, is how important that rhythm section was to everything that was vital about status quo. And to do that to that band is more criminal than I can think of nearly any other band with regards to their rhythm section. Fascinatingly annoying. But there you go. Anyway, my number six has lots of John Coughlin on it. Okay, lots and lots. I've got a really old battered copy of On The Level from 1975. This is their eighth album, Beautiful Gatefold, which, and this album has probably never actually, I don't even know if there's lyrics on here or anything, because I've probably never played it. I bought it because I like the Gatefold. There you go, the record even falls out the bottom of the, the bag, because at the age that I was at, I was going out and just going, oh, status quo, and buying all of these reissues. <laughs> <That was horrible. laughs> All of the fame ones that all have these, or priceless ones, sorry, that all have these horrible inlays. I've got lots of Kiss albums with these in them as well. Um, but yeah, on the level, this is 1975. What a fantastic album this is. I'm really, I mean, close where it started for me. This, this is how this journey into music began for me. My brother had 12 gold bars. The first album that I bought with my own money was the double one with vo volume two on it in 1984. The first cassette, which I had before, I even had a vinyl album was Just Supposing, along with Ace of Spades by Motorhead, not a bad place to start. And that this, the, this was the band that really started my journey into rock music. And these are the albums that did that. I had all of this kind of era right from the off. So you've got Down Down, which I believe is probably the only number one hit single that they had. Phenomenal song, just outstandingly good. I mean, this album entered the charts at number one. You've got Bye Bye Johnny, which really, I mean, that should be terrible. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> it's so good. And I don't like the highlight cover version, but it's just so believable. Do you know they get it right? Little Lady, that's a great opener. Most of the time, do you know, it's a, a really kind of slow, quiet track that bursts in a proper dirty boogie, do you know? And then you've got Over and Done, Alan Lancaster, and I'm going to rave about him and Coughlin a lot, an awful lot, because to me, they never have quite got the credit because of how long the story goes on after them. But yeah, just fantastic. And same again, Bob Young, who I had the pleasure of interviewing quite a few years back now, who really, he reworked a lot of Quo classics into a kind of country style, because that's really where his songwriting comes from. So he would bring in these kind of country songs and Quo would Quoify them. So to hear them stripped back was quite fascinating. I don't prefer any of them over what happened here, but it's interesting that that's the journey these songs took. They're not just a boogie band, there's a real kind of country base in there as well. So, yeah, on the level, that's my number six. And I think for a lot of people, that might be their number one, right? I mean, that's that's a yeah. pretty popular album across the board, I think. I would say I'm quite controversial for having that so low. More about that later. Uh, Number six for me, right? We're at number six. Yes, uh, I'm going to go with 1976's Blue for you. Is there a better way? <laughs> I don't think so. Probably my favorite status, sorry, status quo. I wanted to say status, damn American. I wanted to say, uh, it, it's probably my favorite status quo song. Love it. Absolutely love it. Ring for a Change. Great song. Fast and Furious, just like you like it. Uh, I like the little jazzy bits in the title track. Kind of different, right? Uh Rain just crushes. Man, such a good song. Uh, I like, again, we got another long one on here. Mystery song, right? It's boogie, a little bit of jamming. 
I like that, uh, you know, they kind of go some different directions on that. I like the fact like early on, they threw all these long tracks on there that kind of, you know, did some different things. You know, the rest of the album is, is your standard, you know, quo boogie, but that's, this is the time frame where that's what they did. They did it well. And uh, that's what you expected from them. So I quite like this album a lot. And I think they look, uh, they look kind of quoish in their denim on the front and uh, very confident, I might add. So I uh, like the young English gentleman that they were. So that's my number six. There's a reason for that album cover and I'll get to it when, when there's more about that album later. Gotcha. All right, cool. Awesome. That's Less cool. about the album now. My number five is Pile Driver. Oh, yes. Feel, feel like, ah, there we go again. Yep, um, quite a misleading name actually, because in many ways it doesn't pile drive. Um, it's their first hit, proper hit album, charted at five, um, arguably the first actual quo album that, you know, that boogies like most of the time, you know, is Don't Waste My Time, the first real quo song. These are the kind of debates that you need to have, but it does have um, Paper Plane on it, which I feel like I might have said on a previous video, is amongst the greatest things in the history of mankind and phenomenally heavy. Yeah. Really, really is. It's just, I actually wrote fuck and three exclamation marks next to it. It's just, I love that song. I, I genuinely, genuinely love it. I really, really do. You gotta um, remind yourself in the notes, right? Because you want to make sure you punctuate that, right? Absolutely. You gotta punctuate your notes, haven't you? Just, just duh. One exclamation mark just will not do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've got to punctuate like you're a teenage girl. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and little smile, I put a little smiley emoji next to it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, it's a really great record Big Fat Mama is, is just immense absolutely immense um, the reason why it's not higher and I think we all know why is because it's got a Doors cover on it Next well, like what like nine minutes long or whatever it is yeah seven minutes 26 seconds there, there you of, go. Not, of not fun <laughs> you know, do you know we talked previously off air about the uh, Deep Purple version of this song yeah that shite this is just no no, no, but that's, you know, that's just me. No, no to doors. I wouldn't even have them in my house if I didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, oh, that said, it's a great record. And you know, they're all pretty short, short as well, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. You know. Other than Broadway's Blues. No, I mean, the actual albums. Oh, the album itself, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty, yeah, yeah. Short, pretty short. I mean, you know, I know. At risk of you know opening up the comments, but this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the you know, the the med records that med sense they said what they wanted to say, off they went. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. very true. No need, no need to make 38, 38 you know, 38 um, demos and stuff and put no, just this is what we're saying. Good stuff. And Power yeah. Driver is an excellent record. <clears throat> I'd rather you give me 32 minutes of phenomenal music. Then you gave me 70 minutes where over half of it is mediocre because you forget the, the 32 minutes that are brilliant. Okay. You know? And my number five. Excellent awesome. choice. There you go. And there's a reason why it's not higher. And that reason is because it's got a doors cover on it. <laughs> because if there's one thing I don't like, it's the doors. If I, didn't, if I didn't have to, I wouldn't have them in my house. I really hate the doors as well. I'm sorry, Peter. I know you've got a door soft spot. I hate the doors. I always have. I had a friend many years ago who used to insist on playing them all the damn time. And man, oh man, do I hate the doors. As covers go, it's the doors. So the rest of the album, though, is utterly outstanding. And yes, paper plane. And listening to those guys sing together, is just a thing of beauty, a thing of absolute beauty that's sitting atop a phenomenal riff. Paper Plane's brilliant. All of this is brilliant. Don't Waste My Time. Oh, baby, is fantastic. It's just, it's <laughs> all so good. And then they close it out with the longest song that's a Doors cover, and it drops from being in my top two to my number five. But it's a great album. Pile Driver is a great album, and it's got this utterly bonkers ape thing on the back holding the bomb, which I always liked. There you go, <laughs> number five. There you go. I, I tell you, I love the Doors, but I don't like people covering the Doors. 
Oh, I prefer people covering the doors than the doors. <laughs> oh, really? No, I, I don't want to hear anybody cover the doors. Only the doors can do the doors. That's just my opinion. But my number five has already been mentioned. Uh, I like this album a lot. Ma Kelly's Greasy Spoon from 1970. Uh, I agree with everything you guys have said. Um, you know, great stuff on here. Kind of leaving the psych behind. A lot of blues guitar wailing all over the place on here. Uh, I actually like Daughter quite a bit. I think that song kicks ass. Um, Shy Fly is amazing. April, Spring, Summer, and Wednesdays. Interesting title. like that quite a bit. Junior's Wailing. Absolutely kick ass. Absolutely kick ass. Uh, you got, you know, some cool acoustic tones on the Lackey Lady, whatever that means, uh, which is a little bit different for them. Need Your Love is heavy. And I've already mentioned how much I love Is It Really Me? Gotta Go Home. Love that. Uh, great, great, heavy, 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 heavy status quo track. So yeah, I dig this out. I'm not a big fan of the cover either, but uh, but yeah, it's a really good album. A really great transition album, I think. So that's my number five. Four, Dog of Two Heads, which I believe has the head, sorry, which I believe has an excellent cover. I, I, I need to know more about this cover, please, please don't. So, um, as you said, it's, a, it's an excellent record. Missed the charts completely in the UK again. Where they find where they finding their sound again? Um, <laughs> Uh, the guitar work on um, Unlike Unlight Only is um, absolutely mesmeric. You're not going to put me off. It's not going to happen. Uh, something's going on in my head. Uh, it sounds a little, to me a bit um, cool does the outlaws, you know, that kind of guitars. Um, again, go, hello. It's like it's like being with children. <laughs> put it down. I put it down. <laughs> it, it is a busy cover. I will say that. Yeah, what's going on there? <laughs> mean Girl begins to sound uh, very much like what the Quo were going to become. It's kind of like a good metamorphosis kind of song. And um, Railroad is on this album. Railroad. And you, what you've got to do is you've got to go and grab yourself a mic stand or, or, or a mop, maybe, when you were younger. I don't know. Put it in the middle of the room. Pretend you've got friends. And just exactly, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe you could get your squash racket out, and uh, I don't know that sort of thing. And just you know, pretend you're in mid stage, nod your head, crowd's going wild. Uh, and it finishes, um, I think, importantly, um, with um, well, nearly finishes before the 38th little version of na 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 na, uh, with something's learning, which is just fa fabulous, you know. Didn't necessarily really realize, realize that it was uh, unusually political for them. It's just a great song. And um, yeah, Alan Lancaster wrote some great songs. He really did. And that's one of them. Yeah. Alan Lancaster wrote lots of great songs. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I massively, because of the way that you left the band, or the, because of the way the band reformed without him, he, he's, he's more remembered now, I think, for kind of court cases and various things like that and that are certainly outside of the the real fans of the band and that really kind of hurts me because he was so important at, at, at this era of the band this is my number four this is hello which as you can tell has had an awful lot of play in in my house this is an album that i have played over and over and over and over Do you know it, it's caroline do i really need to hear it ever again Arguably not, but when I do, I still think, bloody hell, that's good. Such a good song. Bob Young involved in it again. So, you know, it, to me, this is this is when it really began. There was a, a kind of a sweet spot for Cole where they just they had a sound and they varied it a little bit, but they were just ruling the world. At the, well, not the world. They were ruling certainly the UK at this stage and lots of Europe, you know, a really big band in, in mainland Europe as well. So... And this was kind of where, where it came in for them. And it's better now. Another kind of overlooked one, bit of a slower song. They do mix it up a little bit. I mean, 4,500 times, as Peter said earlier on. 4,500 times. It's just, do you know, it feels like it was just getting, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger as they were playing it. And it's one that was long requested to get back into the set and has been in recent times. Because it's just such a powerhouse roll over, lay down, but the deeper stuff, Blue-Eyed Lady, Claudie, Softer Ride, Andy Bone's on here, or Bone, Bone, I don't know how to say Bone, but he's I not meant to Well, it could be Bone, it could be, but you say Own, so it could be Bone. Mm. 
I don't know. I'm willing to be corrected because, well, somebody will. Um, but yeah, I really, really like Hello. You can tell, I mean, I'm at album number four here and I'm, I'm raving like a lunatic. Nothing new there. That's how much I like this era of status quo. Dog or two head. Uh, you guys, I think, have basically said uh, all the stuff I would say about this. Great album. I love the guitar work on this album. I, I, I like, you know, especially the era where they were moving away from psychedelia into doing something different. Uh, they really were letting it rip. Well, he was letting it rip on the guitar solos quite a bit. And I really like that. Um, yeah, you mentioned all the great, you know, Mean Girl is just absolutely amazing. Someone's learning, crushing song, lots of guitar solos. Or guitar. Can I mention again that there are a lot of good guitar solos on here? Uh, um Lee Tung or however, whatever, however you say that, great song. Yeah, this is a really good album, really strong album and a very interesting album cover. It's got a great cover on that one, Peter. Yeah, I really, really like that cover. cover. Really good cover. Like anyway, number three. My number three is Blue For You. Which I feel, I feel like has been mentioned. Uh, there we go. I, I can't wait to find out why this is, but uh, I'm guessing, you know. Uh, is there a better way? Well, there, isn't, there aren't many better ways to start an album. <laughs> oh, God. Um, <laughs> I've always wanted to be a DJ. Hey, yeah. Mm, yeah. Your phone might be ringing yet. The more people keep watching the shows, let me tell you. Please, please stop coming on YouTube. Please. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Great, great way to start an album. Um, Mad about the boy, just boogies, chugga chuggers, durders, whatever. Um, this is how we'd say how much we like rain and indeed mystery song. We write rain in capital letters exclamation mark mystery song exclamation mark wow exclamation mark and from there we try to think of something salient to say about the songs other than they're just great which they really really are um that's the fact is on this record i think that's very much the kind of direction that rossi would like to have gone for uh for a, lo a longer period um, I think that's his kind of bag. He likes that kind of country-ish, folkish, Americanish guy. Uh, his solo albums are very folky, country-ish. Uh, yes, anyhow. And this is where Andrew B.O.W.N. kind of really makes his mark on this on this record. And to some extent, they kind of guillotine the boogie a little bit to come up, edging towards that more commercial sound. And yet, it was a UK number one. Yeah. Stat fans. Stuff. Yeah. I've done. So my number three is just supposing. Yeah, the sound has changed a little bit. The production has changed a little bit. They are, as Simon mentioned, scene chasing a little bit. This is where you start to get these kind of bizarre, high-pitched backing vocals that kind of seem in there somewhere for some strange reason. But I really like them. And when I sing along with these songs, it tends to be that know that I can't reach that I'm trying to do all the time and I don't know it just it really ticks the boxes for me I really like rock and roll the song it is cheesy and it was a single that came out between albums um but same again in the same way that living on an island does it's I mean you think rock and roll I mean we all know other songs called rock and roll and they go but this is it's melancholy. It's all about what they don't like about being in a rock and roll band. It's all about having to write the same song. It's all about having to, you know, do the same thing. It's all about being controlled, really. That's what that song's about. It's not about rock and roll at all. It's all about the fact that rock and roll is all about somebody going, you will do this because it makes us lots of money. <laughs> do you know? And living on an island is very similar in that sense as well. It was, it was very much a gentle rebellion against the fact that they were obviously utterly controlled, realistically. And yeah, so production again, I think we're in Pitt Williams territory here, are we? Am I right in saying that? No, John Eden, sorry, John Eden. That's why it gets a little bit better. It's not Pitt Williams. But the point I was going to make was, it's fascinating how a band that were this established, this successful in their home territory, could be so shaped by whoever produced the album. 
because that's really apparent as you go through their whole catalogue from start to finish. And they produced their own stuff for such a period of time and it was so damn good that why other people got involved in the first place, well, maybe external factors, but maybe also how out of control the band were by the time they get to here, because they are, for want of a better term, if it's a bit of a mess, you know? Um, some of the albums from about this era and a little later that have been reissued with lots of bonus material, there's lots of kind of in the studio, off the cuff stuff, that, and they're clearly plastered, or at least some of them are, Do you know? And they're having great fun. It doesn't really make great listening, to be honest. It's the sort of thing you put on and think, oh, wow, and you'll never put it on ever again. Yeah. I'm sorry. Some, somebody will tell me that they will, but <clears throat> there you go. But yeah, I mean, you've got Over the Edge, Lancaster again, Run to Mummy, which I really like. I like that, yeah, yeah, Run to Mummy, Run to Mummy, yeah, yeah. The staccato vocals, which is a theme from Quo as well. What you're proposing, oh, but da -da 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 -da. it's just, do you know what? I'll apologise to anyone that's watching this because there's an awful lot of this show where my laptop's been doing this and that's because as people are mentioning these songs I'm keeping the beat on the floor <laughs> and I'm having to stop myself when I see things <laughs> pop up a little bit sorry I, I used to play the drums and I grew up playing the drums on these sort of albums so yeah coming and going all of it just supposing really like this album fantastic and another cool rocket cover another cool rocket cover yes indeed oh. Number three for me on the level, on the level could have even been higher. Um, Little Lady, a lot of great kick off the album tracks on these albums, right? Those first songs just get you in, in the mood for what's taste to come. I saw the light over and done. Night Ride is a cool, gritty song. I mean, you know, down, down, leeward and down, down, down. I mean, just so much fun. So much fun. Uh, Broken Man. What to do? Bye bye, Johnny. It all rules. A lot of fun. This, this to me, I you know, I think if somewhere to come, someone would come to me and ask me, well, what's the best status quo album to start with? First of all, I'm probably not the right guy to ask that question. But anyway, but if they were, uh, I would probably tell them to go start here. This to me seems like the prototypical first place you go with this band or the live album. Yeah, I'd probably tell them the live album. Ah, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Anyway. That's my number three. It's my number two. Hold it up again. There, there you go. go. Yes, indeed. Um, I'm, I'm, while you were talking, I was almost prepared to commit to saying that Down Down is the best UK number one single of all time. That's a big call. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even better than Shut Up Your Face by Joe, by Joe Dolce. You know, that's how good it is. I know. I know. <laughs> child yeah uh, but it, it is a phenomenally exciting piece of music is um down there, you know and especially when when you see them live and they're just noodling around before before it really before it really kicks in it's just absolutely excellent most of the time surprisingly heavy heavy blues um the reason why this isn't number one is because it breaks the chuck berry rule uh, good simon it's good sorry it's good though Yes, but it breaks the tutorial. So when you're trying to weigh up what's one and what's not, and you're looking down the credits and you think, ah, that's Uncle Chuck. That's a, de <laughs> that's a demerit point, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. Yes, it is. I'm right. So every, if everybody watching, we now see the reason why and these Ranking the Album shows cover songs are not a good idea. And it can be, but just not Chuck Berry. And definitely oh, not. And definitely not the doors, right? <laughs> oh, not no, no, no. 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 Um, before I finish, I, I, I would like to say, a, it's less than thirty-eight minutes long, and it's thirty-eight quality minutes, but including the Chuck Berry song. Let's be brutally honest. Um, and uh, you were talking about being a drummer at night, right? Just you know, I was driving along the other day, and then I suddenly realised I was drumming along, and. Uh, Oh, I really should be focusing the world. <laughs> As the other car is coming straight for him, right? <laughs> Listening to the quo. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, very much so. So that's my number two. Well, my number two has just changed. <laughs> that's Ooh. very sick. I've put, I've put another one there. So my number two now is 
Blue for you. Blue for you. Okay. Sure. And I'll show you a different one. Okay. So I'll show you <clears throat> blue for you. Wow. Okay. Which is very nice indeed. Yeah, that's not been out there for a long, long time. Pretty cool. Okay. Now the reason, because cool, yeah, they, they did the, they did the denim. They always did the denim. There are stories that Kevin Dubrow from Quiet Riot, when Quo would go over to the US because they did try and break America, he would trade them all the jeans because he would spend all his time wearing the same one or two pairs of jeans. Now, how true that is, I don't know, but that Kevin is quoted in one of the Quiet Riot books I've got somewhere as saying that that was what he would do. They would come over and he would trade jeans with them because they needed old jeans. That's like going to Soviet Russia. Well, yeah, I mean, well, I don't think Kevin Dubrow were there. Quiet Riot never kind of broke massive in Soviet Russia. Don't Kevin think. Dubrovsky. Uh, no. Well, <laughs> 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 oh, dearie me. <laughs> so these, these denims are not old, are they? These denims are new because status quo was sponsored by Levi. Okay, and when they played, there was Levi kind of logos and various things around. So hence, ah. why, hence why they look remarkably unco-like at this point. This is this is not what they really looked like, and it's the only point where they really did. You know, there we go. So yeah, blue for you. This is now my number two. It was my number one until about ten minutes ago when I've been looking at these covers and going, I have to put a different one at number one because for certain aspects that I'll get to when I get there. Is there a better way? There isn't really. Uh, it's another Lancaster one. It's fantastically good. Mad about the boy. That's a little bit quirky. Oh, mad about the boy. So, oh, oh, oh. And that's, there's Francis Rossi's kind of influence as well. What a singer. What a singer. Lots of character about his voice. Never going to be the best vocalist in the world, but loads of character about his voice. Ring of a change. Really like that. Do you know, there's there's those falsetto backing vocals as well. They're in there as early as that. 1976, album number nine, Rain. We've covered that phenomenal mystery song. We've covered that too. They're the only Rick Parfit written songs on this album. Two singles. And they're absolutely outstandingly good. Mystery song. I absolutely adore that little clean intro. Welcome to the Chrysalide Ball. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. And I used to listen to that album at night, lights off. Absolutely adored that bit. Listened to it the other day, middle of the afternoon. Still adore that bit. It's just so good. But as Peter mentioned, Blue For You, that's... I mean, it shouldn't work on a status quo album, but it does. really, really does. I like Rolling Home, not Rolling Home. We'll talk about Rolling Home on a different show. Can't be many bands have had such similarly titled songs, but there you go. That that turns into prime time steam train movie. That's what that does. And blue for you, it was number one till about ten minutes ago. It's number two now. It'll be number one again tomorrow. Who worries about it? So yeah, really like blue for you. There you go. Number two for me, pile driver. Yeah, I will admit I don't really like the Roadhouse Blues cover either. I would have rather heard another original song because uh, I think this album kicks mucho ass. Don't Waste My Time, Oh Baby, Unspoken Words, Big Fat Mama, Ugh, love it. Paper Plane is immense. All the Reasons, which has these kind of like cool, like Wishbone Ash guitar solos going out through it. So I just named like almost every song on here that I really like a lot. And there's really no reason to talk about Roadhouse Blues. Um, yeah, this probably would have been my number one. Uh, but I really like my number one even more. So, but yeah, Pile Driver, great. Love the album cover too. I mean, they look like they're an ass kicking band, right? And then you got the weird gorilla on the back. So, but yeah, that, that cover is a statement of intent, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't even see their faces. They got the hair all over the place, the guitars, all three of them. I mean, that's just like, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think I remember the first time I saw this album cover, I had no clue what this band was all about. I'm like, oh, this must be the heaviest album on the planet. Well, it isn't quite, but it, it's pretty rocking. So they just looked the part, right? And that's that's what it's all about. The number one, woo, drum roll. Here we go. Yes, and the correct answer for number one um, is hello. Hello, hello, hello. Um, let's just let's just examine why. I'm right. Uh, roll over, lay down. 
<laughs> Caroline, 4,500 times softer ride. Mm -hmm. Blue-eyed lady. Oh, yeah. Just fan and what can only be described as tastic. Utterly, utterly brilliant. Um, it's just great record. Really, really is. Um, I, I weirdly have a soft spot for the song Claudie. It's somewhat atypical, uh, but just really good. And I was, I tend to prep all this stuff in the car while I'm driving around, as I may have mentioned before. And yesterday I was taking my niece to netball. And um, she momentarily looked up from TikTok for about three seconds. And actually, she definitely never heard the call before. I actually started sing along with It's Better Now. Like first time ever, it's simple, effective, genius. And if you can do that, it, it's what it's good shit. And it's uh, my number one. Hello. Choice. And it's, I mean, it probably is the right choice. I would imagine that there's an awful lot of people who would put that as their number one. So I'm actually not going to tell you that you're wrong, other than the fact that I chosen something else. You usually do tell me I'm wrong. I usually do. So I thought, no, do you know, I, I mean, I would being serious for a very short period of time here, I could probably tell you from my number six upwards here on a different day could be my number one. The, the quote really mean a lot to me, I have to say, but my number one, and I changed it because I was talking earlier on about, so maybe not 10 minutes ago, probably two hours and 10 minutes ago, about the Frantic Four getting back together. And that was really special for me because by the time I got, as I got into an awful lot of bands at exactly the wrong time, so the first status quo album that I bought on week of release was In the Army Now, because that's just the age that I was at the stage. At that stage, it was, oh, it's a cool album, and the singles have been good. More about that a different day. Okay, so I got in those albums or bands at exactly the wrong time. Everything was great prior to that, you know? So to me, it was all about the Frantic Four, and I believed that I would never see that band. I would never see those four guys together. I mean, Alan Lancaster spent most of the last three decades, four decades in Australia. A couple of bands, but, you know, no profile over here whatsoever. John Coughlin is still touring in his own version of Quo, um, who I've never seen, but I believe are really quite good. Uh, but seeing those four together and the songs that really raised the hairs on the back of my neck were Backwater and Just Take Me off of Quo. Lancaster is just utterly outstanding on this album. His vocals, his bass playing, his songwriting is just ridiculously good. Co writes with Parfit, Backwater, and Just Take Me. Then you've got Rossi Young, Parfit, Lancaster, and Coglin on Break the Rules, which is outstandingly good. Drifting Away, another co write with Parfit, Don't Think It Matters, another co write with Parfit. And then Lonely Man as well. I mean, th this is his album, and he's just phenomenal on it. And that drum break, where oh, I live for that every time I put that album on. And live, it absolutely delivered. And it did everything that I wanted it to do for me. And that was, that's why right at the last minute that I thought, and I'm getting tingles as I'm thinking about it, it was just so exciting that I can't not choose that as my number one album. And I just, I like everything about it. Always have. It's a little bit deeper, a little bit darker than everything else in the, in the, they did during that era, but it's also still quintessential quo. And that's my number one, is quo. And that's my number one as well. Yeah. Um, I always thought that there was something about this album that really connected with me in a different way than some of the other albums do uh i really like the production of this album there's a real edge to to this album like it almost, it's almost like this is the album where quo were like hmm it's 1974 we probably could almost be like a metal band if we wanted to because there's some really heavy stuff going on here there's still the, the boogie feel is still there but there's there's a heft to the guitar work on here that I really like a lot. Produced by Status Quo. Why did they ever not do that ever again? I don't know. It's just a great I mean, album. Well, anyway, so Yeah, it's um, Backward, Just Take Me, uh, Break the Rules is awesome. 
drifting away is so heavy. I love the guitars on Don't Think It Matters. I love the jams of Slow Train. Uh, Lonely Night is kind of Rolling Stones-y kind of. Uh, I don't know. It just sounds different from all the other status quo albums. And I love the cover. Yeah, absolutely love the cover. I mean, this is like a genius painting, man. It's just so cool. I have to think that uh, Mr. Ackerfeld from Opeth took a little something from this when they designed, you know, an album I'm talking about, right? Yeah, there's something about it. Uh, just such a great album. It rocks and rocks and rocks. Not like these other albums don't, because they're all great. Um, but yeah, I think the the more I thought about it as we were, I was putting this together, I'm like, yeah, it's got to be my number one. Got to be my number one. So there you have it. There you go. And as myself and Simon were chatting about, well, emailing about probably last weekend, whenever it was, in the comments, I know for a fact that there are going to be an awful lot of people that will still, and we don't do live albums. I know we don't do live albums. This is not a live album show that will tell you that this is number one. Okay. Yeah. This is cool live. Right. And yeah. It's, I, my, go to, it's my go to. I'm to listen to this band. That's what I pull out. Yeah. This is, this is an outstandingly good live album. And it's just based around that early era. And it's just phenomenal. Yeah. Mainly recorded, not all that far from me in Glasgow. It's just a ridiculously strong, heavy album. There's jamming on it. There's long songs, but there's hits. There's things you can sing along with. that are absolute juggernaut yeah. on this album. Phenomenal. And we've laughed and joked, and we are going to do a show with them an awful lot less kind, and deservedly so, I would suggest. Um, but realistically, maybe something that we haven't emphasised quite enough is just how damn good those four musicians were, so, you know, and as a guitar duo, outstandingly good. And it's not just, it's really not. You, and it doesn't take, once you get into the right era of quote and get beyond some fantastically good singles, they do an awful lot more than that. Yeah. So there you go, I'll go off my high horse now. <laughs> Well, a lot of good stuff here, right? So uh, prepare for part two of this, which uh, won't be quite as good, but it will be just as fun, I think. It, before well, we, can I, can I just big up? Yep. Rick Parfitt's yes. solo. It's really good. It's well worth a listen. It's really vibrant. Uh, I listened to it this afternoon and thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. I really did. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really good. There are two different mixes. Yes, two versions are. Uh, and both are worth a listen. One to me is slightly better than, than the other. But yeah, a very interesting idea as well to, to have, because of when it was kind of finished, which was just after he died, unfortunately, there were other people that had ideas about the mix. But they were also, I would suggest, open enough to say, you know, that's not necessarily what Rick would have wanted. So let's let people hear both. What a great way to do it. What an absolutely fantastic way to do it. And a lot of people could learn from that ethos. Or, ethos, or do you know what? Maybe we're not right. So let's just put both out there and let people who want to go out and spend time on these albums decide. But yes, that's a really good uh, pick there, Simon. That's a, such a good album. And really went under the radar completely. Cool. There you have it, everybody. Uh, our favorite 10 status quo albums in the comments below. Please list your top 10. And uh, stay tuned in roughly a week and a half or so for part two, where Simon and Stephen are going to talk about the bottom 10. So uh, that's upcoming. Yes, indeed. So uh, in the meantime, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. Uh, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. But of course, more importantly, make sure you hang out here all the damn time on our YouTube channel. Uh, coming up, we've got, oh, geez, the Monsters Den tonight. Stay tuned for that. We've got, uh, si uh, not Simon, um, Martin Popoff is coming back tomorrow morning at the Fun House. I was going to say Simon Popoff. I'm like, no, I'm getting my names confused. Sorry, it's been a long week, folks. Um, and uh, recovering from... A long uh, show. Not fun. Yeah, a long show too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And an album homework assignment on the Sunday. So stay tuned for all of that. For Simon Bray and Stephen Reed, I am Pete Pardo. Thanks for watching, everybody, and this fun show about the quo. Take care. We'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.